I need thee every, I need thee every second. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, many of us are just coming back from our annual marriage retreat. Those of you who went, show us your bands if you were on the marriage retreat. All right, hold them up. <laughs> marriage power. If you want to know what that band is about, you ask any one of the people that are wearing that band, they'll be glad to share a testimony with you. I promise you that. Also, if you'd like to buy one, Tim Strickland set the price at, what was it, $1,400 each? So for the low, low price of $2,800, you can have one for your family. Two, basically. One for your wife, one for you. Amen? So be sure and uh, be sure. No, don't buy one. Get one free stuff, man. It ain't working that way. Keep him away from the prize gun. <laughs> but praise the Lord. It was a great time. I shared with him the story that uh, not too long after the kids had all left home, praise the Lord. <laughs> Kathy and I were on the couch. She was watching something on TV, and she laid her head on my lap, and she has these little funky reading glasses she likes to wear. Uh, some of them are quite different looking. So I reached down and took the glasses off her face and kind of caressed her face. As you know, honey, I said, without those silly reading glasses on, you look like the, the woman I married so many years ago. You're still that young, beautiful you. She says, you know what? I said, what? She said, without my glasses, you look pretty good, too. <laughs> so. and, and you know how it goes sometimes, guys, right? <laughs> but it was a tremendous blessing. If you did not go, be sure and mark it down. This was the 20th marriage retreat that we have hosted. 20. And for some of you have been to almost every one of them, you'd have to agree it's probably the best we've ever done, wouldn't you think? Yeah. Amen. Wasn't it probably the most fantastic time and the uh, blessed time that we had in the Lord? It was, it was really pretty phenomenal. And uh, I, maybe we'll have some testimonies on Wednesday night to have a couple people share testimony about what God did. But it's, it was really a good time with the Lord. We're going to receive the, the Lord's Supper. We're taking a little interrupted break in uh, our series on Philippians to have communion together. We like to take this time to share with each other and remind ourselves of all that the Lord's done for us, the commitment that He made to us, the commitment that we should be making to Him. And many times we take a lot of different elements about the Lord's Supper and about the, the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus, and we, we share some on it before we receive the Lord's Supper together. So we encourage you to listen today, and we'll have even a time, as the Scripture tells us, for examination of our own hearts to resolve anything that might be there that would hinder us from receiving the Lord's Supper. But uh, perhaps you're not a member of Believer's Fellowship. Uh, our church does not practice closed communion. Uh, so we're not here to examine you to see if you're, if you're uh, acceptable to receive the Lord's Supper. The Bible says, let every man examine himself. So you take the moment to examine your heart. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ is obviously the first step in that. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, well, it's not too late even before we receive the Lord's Supper. Uh, you can open up your heart and your life to the Lord, and He can change you eternally and forever. You'll never be the same. But as we look at the Lord's Supper today, I, I think I shared something maybe four years ago on this. We talked about it a little bit, and so I thought to myself, I couldn't remember most of it, so I doubt that you will. And I studied. <laughs> So I just want to just briefly go over or something that most of us are familiar with in the Lord's Supper. And, and especially in regards, remember, as he took the Lord's Supper, they were receiving Passover. The disciples were together. Jesus had told his disciples, I have longed to have this Passover with you. And so we'll look at the significance of that. But there, the cup and the bread and the things that were shared in communion, we want to specifically talk about that and in regards to how it related to the Passover meal itself. And uh, look at that today. In fact, we start in Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. It says, And when he had come, he reclined at the table. And when the hour had come, he reclined at the table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and had given thanks, he said, Take this, share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup which is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. In fact, we're talking about a cup here and a cup there. There are four cups 
that are related to the Seder, to the Passover meal. Four cups that uh, were placed upon the table and were drank from in a specific time in the meal and in a specific order. Now, there's no sacrifice going on in the temple anymore. There was no, there's no tabernacle set up. The, the Seder was the way, the Passover was the way that they, they uh, clarified and remembered the deliverance that they had experienced under the Egyptians. Part of the order of this Passover meal, this meal of remembrance, was drinking from these four cups. And we want to look at when they would be taken in the meal and drank from in the meal. The four cups literally stand for the four I wills in Exodus. In Exodus, the Lord is speaking to Moses about the deliverance of the children of Israel and what he's going to do. And it's a prophetic word to Moses in more ways than one. Prophetic in regard to what is getting ready to happen just in days and months ahead of them. How God is going to deliver them from a couple of hundred years of slavery to the Egyptians. Also prophetic in a way that the Lord would deliver all of us from the burden and the bondage of Satan and of sin. Paul writes in Corinthians, all these things happen to them, the children of Israel, the Egyptian, the wilderness experience, Canaan, all that happened to them for our understanding. It was all, yes, it was reality, they experienced it all, but there is a greater prophetic lesson to be learned, and that is that one would come as the deliverer. Listen to Exodus 6 as the Lord speaks to Moses in this passage. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm, and with great judgments. Now obviously we see that in the Lord Jesus Christ, do we not, who suffered all that judgment for us. And I will take to you, I will take you for my people and I will be your God and you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Now we said these four cups are based upon the four promises. Here are the, the basic four promises that the Lord speaks in this passage. I, I will take you out, I'm going to rescue, you, I'm going to redeem you, and I shall bring you out from under. So these four promises that God tells them that he's going to do, and he speaks these words to Moses, reveals the plan by which God is going to do something and how he would redeem the children of Israel from the bondage. But in a greater prophetic sense, it's God speaking and revealing how ultimately he would redeem all of us who come to Jesus Christ, how he would redeem the elect saints of God who would come, become his children. So let's just briefly look at these four cups and how they relate to Passover, how they relate to our salvation and to what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. The four promises of this passage, we had the four cups of the Passover feast. They're the cup of sanctification, the cup of judgment is called or deliverance, the cup of redemption, and the last cup would be the cup of restoration or also called the cup of hope or the cup of praise. The first cup is the, is the cup of sanctification. This is the first part of, of the Kaddush or of Thanksgiving. This cup of sanctification is God promising to bring his people out from the Egyptian cruelty, the Egyptian taskmasters, and set them free. Now this obviously doesn't take a great theologian to realize how this parallels to the promise that God makes to us through Jesus Christ, how we can be set free and made a part of his family. And we can experience a sanctification, a cleansing from our sins, a releasing from taskmaster of sin and of Satan, of even our own flesh. This, this cup of sanctification represents this new life for us. So we see clearly a parallel. But the second cup that would be taken during the Passover meal is, uh, is the cup of judgment. And it does have a lot of parallels with our faith. God brought great judgments upon the Egyptians. You, you read the story, or at least you saw the movie, right? And how that judgment came, and it was all the pestilence and all the flies and frogs and everything else that they experienced in, in Egypt as God dealt with the Egyptians and sent one plague after another plague after another plague. Ultimately, remember, the final judgment where the death angel came and passed through the land of Egypt and slew the firstborn of every house that was not marked with the blood of a spotless lamb. God had given his people the answer to deliverance. Take the spotless lamb, prepare it, 
sacrifice it, sprinkle its blood on the doors, and then eat this meal of remembrance, this Passover meal. That was the first Passover. Now, for us, we understand that that spotless lamb is the death of God's only begotten Son who died on the cross for us, the Passover lamb. During this part of the, the Feast of Pesach, the Passover lamb, that we'd come to the point where they would begin the, the process of explaining everything on the table and eating of the lamb. It's followed by what was called the Shulchan Oric or the Passover supper. That was the sharing of the lamb, the unleavened bread, the bitter herbs. Uh, it was during that part of the meal in the upper room that Judas is released by Jesus to go do quickly what he's going to do. He leaves before Jesus takes these two elements out of the Passover meal of bread and wine and has communion with his disciples. It's after he leaves the feast that Jesus institutes this memorial meal that we're receiving today. So that was the cup of, of judgment or the cup of deliverance. The third cup is called the cup of redemption. Catch up to myself here. Are we there yet? The cup of redemption. He says in Exodus 6, I will redeem you without, blessed, without stretched arms. This, is, this part of the feast is called the Haggalah, the cup of redemption, the cup of blessing, the, the cup of, 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 of blessing. And, and verse 15, the Lord says in Luke, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. And by the way, why this one? It's the one where he would institute the new covenant. It's the one, in fact, it's the last one. All right, this is the final Passover in regards to all that, everything that was prophetically predicted through Passover about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's receiving it with his disciples as his final Passover. Verse 20 says, after they had eaten the supper. Now that's significant in scripture because it points out which cup they're going to take. They've had the Passover and in the process of Passover meal, the next cup to drink from would be this cup of redemption. It's the cup of redemption that Jesus takes. And he literally gives it a new name. He calls it the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And we see, begin to see very clearly the power of the blood and all the reasons why the blood had to be shed. That someone had to die in your place and take your sin upon themselves you could not do this for yourself. You couldn't offer your own sacrifice because the Bible says we're all sinners. We're all tainted by our own guilt, our own depravity, our own sin. All right? We're dirty. We're, un, we're, we're not clean. But here comes the spotless Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus. Now, I want you to think about something. I mean, we've said a thousand times, and I think because we repeat it and sing it and say it so often, I don't know if we really get the whole meaning of it. But let me just say this. Listen carefully to each word. Someone had to die for me. Someone had to die for me. Now, let's try this together. We're going to all say it out loud together. Maybe that'll help us get the power of what's being said here. Someone had to die for me. One more time, someone had to die for me. There's no way we'll experience salvation. There's no way to be delivered from the bondage of sin. There's no way to be delivered from hell. There's no way to get entry into heaven unless someone dies for me. I mean, for me. And not just anyone can do this. The one who has to die has to be spotless, without blemish, no, no sin, pure, perfect offering and sacrifice. It's all that God's going to accept. That's what, it's awesome to think someone dies for me. We see that in the context on a very big sense in wars and things and our freedom and our nation. But I'm talking about something on a whole different level. You as an individual and your eternal soul. You will die and you will go to hell if someone doesn't die in your stead and pay the price and do for you what you cannot do for yourself. No righteousness of your own, no religiosity of your own, no effort, none of it's going to work. No matter how noble you might perform it, no matter what motive you might have, it's not going to work because all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. Someone has to die. 
Someone's got to take my place for me. And this is exactly what Jesus is predicting to him when he says, this is the cup. You know, it, this, this is the Passover. All you saw in Genesis, that judgment, firstborn males taken every home where they're, they're, hey, now this firstborn male is going to die in my place. This begotten of men. He's coming, this Lamb of God, this Son of God, this God-man, this man-God. In Passover, it was one lamb for one home for one family. Now we have one man who stands for all of Adam's family. By one man, righteousness can be received as a gift. By one man's offering, we can be made right with God. This is the script, Scripture's teaching of all the New Testament. And on the Day of Atonement, that sacrifice was made for an entire nation. And Jesus went to the cross for an entire human population, human race. Past, present, and that which is to come. I love what Hebrews says about the cross of Jesus. It says, once for all. Meaning once for all time, but once for all people. And anybody who will come to him and receive him, accept and trust him as their Lord and Savior can experience this redemption. I love when John the Baptist is baptizing those people by the Jordan and Jesus comes pressing his way through the crowd and John says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What a, what a moment. 3 p.m. on the day of the crucifixion, Jesus declares from the cross, it's finished. The payment's made. It's done. No more sacrifice. Now, in Jesus sitting in this upper room, there, there's a story that Ray Vanderlyn, we did a series with him, remember, in, in one of our video series that we did on Wednesday nights. And he tells the story of what he called wine for the bride. It's in, the first century, in the first century, when a young Jewish man reached the marrying age, He's ready to have a bride. His, his family selected an appropriate wife for him. <laughs> Some of our younger men and young, younger women are going, <laughs> no, I don't think so. They selected the wife for him. And the young man and his father, there would come a day when, when the whole process would begin where they would go meet the young lady. And the father and the young man would go to that family's house and they'd begin to negotiate the, the bride price, the cost of, uh, the, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of this bride. And it's usually a figurative cost re representing replacing the value of that daughter within the family. What's it going to cost us? You say, yeah, maybe a couple of goats. No, listen, the price was usually very high. Very high to negotiate for this. When negotiations were completed, the custom was for the young man's father to take a cup and pour a cup of wine and hand it to his son. The son would then in turn uh, uh, go to the young woman and lift this cup up before her and hold it out to her saying something like this, this is the cup of a new covenant in my blood that, you know, that I offer to you. In more common vernacular, it'd be like, you know, will you marry me? I love you. <laughs> I'll give you the rest of my life. I want you to be my wife. Will you marry me? And at this point, the young woman could, uh, she had this choice. She could take the cup, return it, say no. Or she could answer without saying a word just by drinking from the cup. Her way of saying, I accept your offer. I give you my life in response to me, you giving me your life. Now let's transition to the upper room in that night when the, of the Last Supper when Jesus is, and his disciples are sat there gathering around and celebrating the Passover. The disciples knew the liturgy very well. They'd celebrated Passover all their lives and they're gathered with him. And when it came time to drink this third cup of wine, the cup of redemption, Jesus lifts the cup as the disciples would expect. And he offered that traditional prayer, that, that Seder blessing, said, blessed are you, Lord God, our God, King of the universe who gives us the fruit of the vine. But then in offering it to them, he, he said something that was probably not expected. This cup is a new covenant in my blood for you. I offer to you. Now there's a lot of meanings to that statement. But one in the common ordinary language would be this, as they relate it back to the whole marriage process. I love you. And the only picture I can think of that will describe the power of my love for you 
is the pure love that a husband has for his wife. Now, we, at our marriage retreat, we talked about this a lot, didn't we? This, this whole concept of, of our marriage and, and the sanctity of our marriage and the representation of Christ's relationship to his church as he offers himself as an absolute sacrifice for it. Now here's the Lord Jesus Christ, you know. Uh, it's, it's hard to know exactly what each one of the disciples thought. Um, uh, some understood his willingness to die, be buried, eventually raised to say, I love you. As my father promised your father, I'll pay the price for you. But whatever is coursing through their minds, here's this moment. Jesus knows exactly what's going on and what's about to happen and where he's going and what the price is going to be paid for this bride, to have this particular bride. It's going to cost a very high price. It's going to cost everything. And he's willing at this point to say, I'll offer you my life. Will you be my bride? Taking of the cup at this moment for these men is a solemn moment. It's in that moment that we also, in our own life, are we willing to take the cup as salvation is offered to us, as we understand the cross of Jesus Christ, as we understand that the wages of our sin is death and that someone had to die, as we understand that, can we say back to our heavenly Father and back to his Son, I accept your love, I give you in my, my life as you've given me your life. I respond by giving you my life. It becomes a celebration of God's promise that he redeems us. The Jews used this cup to symbolize the blood of the Passover lamb. We know who the Passover lamb, how significant it is that this taking of this cup is where Jesus says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is for you. Basically saying, I am the Passover lamb. I am the sacrifice for the sins of the people. I'm the one who's going to suffer on your behalf. Never, ever forget, as you enjoy your salvation, as you enjoy the blessings of God on your life, that it comes with a tremendous price. Someone had to die for me, for me to enjoy these blessings of God. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Isaiah 53 from the ESV puts it this way, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. It's good to know that Jesus just doesn't cover our sins. He pays for our sins. He takes the way. He takes the penalty away. When you put your life in his hands, we celebrate this memorial meal. Let's remember that in placing our life into his hands that we pass from death unto life. Just as the children of Israel walked out of Egypt free, we walk into a whole new arena of life free in Jesus Christ. That's the three cups. But what about the fourth cup? There, there is a fourth cup. It's called the cup of praise or restoration. Jesus doesn't drink this cup. It stops right there. I'll not do this again. No, I'm not going to drink this cup until we do it together in the kingdom. When everything is fulfilled, it's the cup of praise, the cup of restoration, the cup of hope. It's, it's at this part of the Passover meal, there would be a recitation of Psalms 136. And if you're familiar with Psalms 136, it's that, it's that psalm that, that makes us give thanks to the Lord. And it says, for his steadfast love endures forever. And then it makes us a statement that says, da, 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 and says, then his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, God of gods, his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to him alone who does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. Hey, if you want to memorize 16 great verses in Psalms, start with 136, 1 through 16, and if you know this part, his steadfast love endures forever, you got half of it memorized already. <laughs> But the beauty of it is, it's repetitive because I think we need to understand his steadfast love endures forever. Thank God for the cross. And thank God that his steadfast love stood fast during the torment and the torture and the beatings, through the crown of thorns, through the nails, through the spear. 
His steadfast love endured forever and endures forever. In the Passover, it's at this point, after the recitation of Psalms 136 and rejoicing in God's steadfast faithfulness and his great love for us that they take and they drink the fourth cup. Some rabbis call it the cup of hope, for it is when we drink it with Jesus at the wedding feast, all our hopes are fulfilled in that moment. The kingdom come. Usually followed at that point by more praise and the leader of the family encouraged the people with the promises of God. For those of us who know the Lord Jesus, get a little glimpse into the Passover, into these cups, we realize that it does symbolize more than just the deliverance for Israel. It symbolizes our deliverance into the hands of God. Our freedom. Now, the Passover, and Tim's done the uh, teaching on Wednesday nights before the, of, of the feast. And the Passover is tightly, closely linked with the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is when you would go through the house and clean out any leaven, you know. Leaven is it's yeast. It's what makes something in dough to rise. It, it, it represents in symbol and in type the way sin works, you know. How it just begins to permeate and to take over and to fester and, and to swell, all right. It symbolizes... The Feast of Leavened Bread symbolized our need to search out our lives, our homes, our family, our relationship to see if there's any sin in it and get it right. Which leads us to what Paul said in teaching the Gentile churches about the Lord's Supper. Just as there was this Feast of Unleavened Bread where you would clean the house out, he says in, in, in 1 Corinthians 11, let every man examine himself. Look in your heart. Where is their disobedience to Christ? Where has there been failure to obey and respond to the promises of God in your life and to the will of God in your life? He says, so that when we come to the Lord's table, is what he called it, when we come to the Lord's table, that we do it with clean hearts, clean lives. The things that have been wrong are made right. That's why the, the Lord's Supper can always be a time of revival if we get real serious about it be a time of refreshing. That when we leave a Lord's Supper service and communion service in church, maybe we ought to walk out free and filled with life and enjoying Jesus in our lives. Get the garbage out. Get the garbage out. You know, I, I don't know what day garbage day is at your house, but today here at church is today. <laughs> Let's get the trash out. Let's get it where it belongs. Let's take these things to the cross and let's get our hearts right. So before we receive this memorial together, I'd like you to stand and, and let's just take a moment of time here to examine our own hearts and see if there's something in our lives that might not be right. If you want to come to the altar, feel free to come to the altar. If you want to come pray with somebody at the altar, there'll be some people standing here around the altar as well. Be glad to pray with you and, 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 and lift you up to the Lord. If you've never received Jesus Christ, and I encourage you as we worship the Lord to come. Give your heart, give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And What better time than right here and right now to do that very thing? Father, we love you. This moment is your moment. This, this, this point in, of this service, I, I just pray that not one of us would miss what you're saying to us or what you're doing in our heart and life. This, this represents a moment of freedom. Lord, there's folks in this room who've been burdened by some things for a long time. God, help them to understand that someone died for them. That they could live in victory and live in freedom. Help them to understand the faith way of accepting and receiving by surrendering their hearts and life to you. For Christians, Lord, I pray, who have areas of their life that aren't right, may this be a time they get their hearts right. Turn those things over to you. Let's take this moment just to worship the Lord and find a place to pray. If you need to come to the altar, you can. You can kneel there at your seat if you like. But let's just worship the Lord during this time. Let's respond to whatever the Lord's saying to us. Come. Step out. Breathe. More than the song I sing 
More than a n a n s e r d e e More than anything Lord, as time goes by I'll be by your side Cause I never want to go back To my old life I need you more More than yesterday I need you more More than words can say can say I need you more than ever before I need you more I need you more I need you more more than yesterday Say I need you more than ever before. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. More than the air I breathe, more than the song I sing, more than my next heartbeat. without the instruments, just the voices I need. Just as a prayer to Him.
The deacons will come forward and those are helping you. You may be seated. So we drink this cup of the covenant and take this bread of communion today. I pray that everything will just be out of your mind except what the Lord Jesus instituted this for. You say, what is that? As often as you do this, remember me. So that all that we do here is to remember all that Christ has done for us and is doing for us. What a mighty God we serve. Scripture says that he took the bread and he broke it among them and said, this is, this is my body which is broken for you. These gentlemen are going to come and pass this bread out amongst you. I'm going to ask you and encourage you just to take it and to hold it. And, and as you're holding it, and wait for us and we will all receive it together. But as you wait, do more than just wait. I'm encouraging you to remember the Lord Jesus. And once they finish passing out, we'll receive it together with a prayer of thanksgiving. To the cross I look To the cross I cling Of its suffering I do drink Of its work I do see For on it my Savior Both bruised and crushed Showed that God is love And God is just At the cross you beckon me Draw me gently to my knees And I am lost for words So lost in love I Sweetly broken, holy surrender. Yeah. Yeah. What a priceless gift. I'm reconciled. You call me out of death. You call me into life. And I was under your. Now through the cross, I'm reconciled. Cross you, beckon me, draw me gently to my knees, and I am lost for words, so lost in love, I'm sweetly broken, holy surrender. Jesus took that bread. It was a bread that according to the Passover, according to law, had to be prepared in a certain way. Unleavened bread, obviously, which represented sin, impure. Pierced was the instruction of the Levitical law, representing the precious body of Jesus Christ who would be pierced for our sins. And had to be baked in such a manner where the stripes would be clearly seen on the bread itself. The Bible says, crushed, bruised striped on our behalf. So what a clear picture we have of the precious, spotless, innocent Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus. So this is for you. It says, and he gave thanks. Let's do the same. With your heads bowed, Father, thank you for sending your Son. Jesus, thank you for offering to us the sacrifice of your body. The suffering, the pain, the heartache. Thank you for your great gift of love. We love you, and we remember you today. The 
holy name of Jesus Christ. Would you take and eat? Precious Savior. You know, when you read the scripture, whether it's in that upper room description or as Paul said that the Lord Jesus gave to him, it says, in the same manner that Jesus took the cup. It's the same manner what? The same manner he'd taken the bread. It was in that same manner, that manner of humility, the manner of obedience and submission to his heavenly Father, that manner of grace, that manner of dignity and love, that manner of mercy that he presents to us, this unspeakable gift. As these gentlemen pass this out to you, I ask you to do the same. Worship the Lord. Take it together, passed out. The blood of Jesus. Praise God for the pure blood Amen. and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you leave here today remembering someone had to die for me. No other way. And his name is Jesus, God's only begotten Son. We celebrate the fact in John 3, 16 that God so loved me, loved you, the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him would not perish, but have every, everlasting, eternal life. Lord Jesus, as you gave thanks, so incredibly knowing everything that's about to befall you, you give thanks. Help us to even begin to understand 
that you, that someone who did die for us, gave everything. Help us to learn the lesson of reciprocation that we should in turn give everything. You are our life. We have no life without you. You're our deliverance. You're our salvation. You're our song in the dark places of our life. Our song of deliverance. And Jesus, as we drink this cup, we look forward to drinking that fourth cup with you in the kingdom. And we do this in remembrance of you today. We love you, Jesus. You tell him that and take and drink in Jesus' name. if you think you possibly can. <laughs> it's always a blessing.